Turkmen, Arabs, etc., often living in the same village. Um, how on earth can you have a state for one particular ethnic group? Well, you can have a state for one particular ethnic group um, if, like in the former Yugoslavia, you drive out people from other ethnic groups and you make it um, racially, ethnically homogenous. But people on the left aren't going to do that. So Ogilvy spent a great deal of time thinking about that, about that question, and he looked at one particular writer, um, left-wing writer, Benedict Anderson, and his book Imagine Communities, um, Reflections on the Origins and Spread of Nationalism, and he thought, well, really what we, what we need is multinational, poly-ethnic political organisms, and we can have a discussion about what that actually means to do with democratic confederalism, whether it means it's a state or not a state, and there will be big debates about that. Because his thinking was that an oppressed people like the Kurds could become oppressors of other ethnic groups. And if you think about the Jewish people, they were definitely oppressed people in Europe. But if we look at this map of, um, of the West Bank in Palestine, it's a Swiss cheese of a thing. It's got roads, settlements all over it, Jewish settlements in Palestinian Arab land. So quite clearly, um, an oppressed people can become an oppressor. And I'm certainly not saying that the Kurdish people would become oppressors, but we're all human, and these sort of things have, have happened in the past. So he was thinking about those sorts of questions. And the other thing that we have to look at the Middle East within the context of, I think, too, is that all the states of the Middle East are artificial creations of imperialism. And that goes back to the First World War, to 1916, when this fellow on the left here, um, his name was Mark Sykes, representing the British government, and this one on the right, his name was um, Francois-Georges uh, Picot, representing the, the French government. They sat down together and they divided the Middle East basically up into the way it is today. And they did so in their own interests, not in the interests of the peoples of the region. They didn't consult the peoples of the region. It was in their own interests. And there was one three-letter word which was high up in the consciousness, and that was oil, which was, become, was beginning to be um, the source of, um, of energy for most of, the, for most of the world at that time, to outstrip, to outstrip coal. So there are artificial creations, um, all of them. Um, I, I believe that France and Britain almost went to war over, over Mosul province in the north of what's today Iraq because both of them wanted to get their hands on the oil. So what Ogilvy argued was that we needed poly-ethnic societies that recognised diversity, that right respected diversity, whether that was um, Arab people, like this poor old man here, a victim of the, of the civil war in, in Syria, or whether it was um, like these people at the bottom who are Turkmen, whether it was Kurdish people, or whether it was Assyrians, like in the top, top corner. Because all of these people live cheek by jowl in that region of the world. Um, the other thing that he looked at was the question of women. And I have to say that the left as a whole, um, for, for a long, long time, was pretty bad on the question of women. And of course the Chinese saying is that women hold up half the sky. They're half the population of the world and there can be no liberation, there can be no socialism, there can be no progress, no human progress unless women are liberated. So that is central to the doctrines of Abdullah Ojalan. He calls it genealogy. And we can, again, argue about some of the propositions that he makes. But I don't think that any of us um, should, um, would, take, would take umbrage, would, take, would, would not agree that this is a central project. And I remember some people on the left, left in Australia have actually said, and I won't say who they are, because they should be embarrassed, I suppose, but I don't want to do it. They've said that, oh, those Kurds in, in Rojava, they've done nothing that goes beyond what um, women in the West have achieved. Well, I'd say, wow, even if they'd done that in that region, um, with the history and with the, the social structures, that would be something. But they've gone far, far beyond that. If, we, if you look at the question of the YPJ and also the YPG, 
um, the fighters, the women fighters, but also that there are women commanders and they are accepted by the males who are fighting under them as the leaders. They can do that. So women hold up half the sky. That's an amazing achievement, I think, for the Roger Revolution. Um, the system that, they, that they're putting into place, and no one says it's perfect, and the conditions that they're doing it under, which is war, um, and surrounded by hostile forces, is absolutely um, incredible. So it's, it's a system, um, as I've said, where women are central, the liberation of women, where all committees, where all councils have to have a male and female co-chair, where there has to be parity of women on all, on all committees, and also where power, instead of coming from the top down, as it does in Australia, which is supposed to be a democracy, power flows from the, the bottom up. Um, um, this, this, I'd say, is a much superior democracy to what we, we have today. As I say, it's not perfect, and the conditions that it's being introduced in and growing in um, aren't the best, but they've come a long way, and it's a, a magnificent achievement. So it's a remarkable achievement in the midst of a ferocious war. So that's the ruins of Kobani um, after the siege, after the siege was lifted by the heroic struggle of the, of the defenders, of the Kurdish defenders. Also, these reforms, these revolutionary changes, I should say, are occurring in traditionally patriarchal societies um, where you have the sort of situation where the great man will walk along and the women will fo woman will follow behind several paces, deferring at all times to the male. And I know that they've had tremendous um, battles um, because it's a thing of consciousness um, with some of the people who say, this is not the way that we've always done it, but nevertheless they are determined and they actually are implementing a system which recognises the, the, rights, uh, the rights of women. Um, and it's an enormous tragedy that in Afrin, the, the, eastern, the westernmost province, canton of Rojava, that was invaded by that barbarian Erdogan and his Isl Islamist gangster friends. And one of the first things, of course, they did was bring back the patriarchy, bring back the oppression of women, apart from the oppression of, of minorities, ethnic cleansing and what have you. Um, it's also a region that they've been able to do this that's river riven by the most ferocious sectarian hatreds, um, prejudices. Um, this poor little boy here, his name was, um, he was one of um, Khalid Sharouf's children. He actually was an Australian, he went then to fight for ISIS. This is a child who's giving this Islamist salute and he wants to kill, or the poor child's dead himself, but he, he wanted to kill the infidels. These children here, um, under ISIS um, tutelage are being trained to behead human beings. Um, so this, this is the sort of region, these are the sort of hatreds that exist in that region and yet they've been able to achieve, the Kurdish people, the YPG, the PYD, the revolutionary forces have been able to achieve so much. So, Rojava is in great danger at the moment and I think of it, um, the, the um, Kurdish um, people and the Kurdish revolutionaries are like as if they're walking a tightrope above a raging sea, but I'd also populate that with sharks. One false move and they're going to fall off and they could, they could be destroyed. And they're absolutely well aware of that. It's in grave danger. So yeah, I think it's absolutely incumbent upon us as progressive people, um, as socialists, as anarchists, because the anarchists in the West have done an awful lot to support the, the revolution. It's incumbent upon us, pressing upon us, it's our, our duty to support them in this grave, grave situation. Some of the sharks that are surrounding them, um, Erdogan up in the corner there, who as I've said, wants to drive the Kurdish people back from the borders of Rojava, 80 kilometres um, to his cordon sanitaire, basically wants to continue what he's doing, ethnic cleansing. Um, Recently, just last week, wasn't it, um, you'll see that um, Angela Merkel, um, Putin from Russia, and Erdogan and um, Macron from France sat down together to decide the future of Syria. Because this person up in the top corner there, of course,